Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction, Jason. Um, I appreciate those uh, opportunities that, that have been afforded by ExamSoft, this one in particular, um, strategically aimed at faculties in particular that are really charged in embracing the concept of, of increasing their proficiency across all types of learning assessment. And that's one of the reasons we're covering this topic today. I will say that my background obviously is primarily in nursing education, so most of my context and examples will arise from that. But there's application obviously across all types of, of uh, academic education for this particular concept. So really what we're looking at today and our objective is to explore a, a trend that, that appears to be um, more than just a passing game, it's, it's, it's happening quite often, which is the formalizing of actual testing and assessment policies with oversight that's not just sporadic, but is actually intentional and ongoing in, in academic programs today. So the question I would initially pose then is, why even consider forming a testing committee and, and what are the potential advantages in doing so? Well, if, if you look at our current situation in higher education, obviously over uh, the last easily 10 or 20 years, there's been a huge push for outcome, measurable types of achievement that happens throughout everything we do now, uh, particularly with affirmation of accreditation, et cetera. It's no longer a process-oriented approach that's, that's used. It's measurement of program outcomes against stated standards. So as this process gathers steam, obviously assessment becomes more and more important as part of the bigger picture of how you evaluate how your program's doing. One of the things that's very clear is that curriculum changes rapidly in many disciplines. That's very true of all the healthcare disciplines and particularly nursing. So that arises gaps that may occur uh, that are sometimes undetected unless there's a true effort going on to focus on that curriculum constantly and make sure that, that gaps have been adequately identified and addressed. The other piece of this that um, is feeding a need for a testing committee in an academic program today is the, the consumer of education, obviously the student. And we've seen this trend of continually um, challenging actually faculties in all programs for academically at risk students. So the students that are not as well prepared as they probably should be for their collegiate careers, entering a program and without sufficient support, essentially flying under your radar as a faculty or avoidance in many cases, which has been documented in the nursing literature as the student spirals in a downward spin academically and the faculty then are faced with a completely inadequate or even late response as a student has progressed towards graduation and now their deficits are becoming much more severe and apparent as they move into the upper division of their major. So the testing committee can be a source of aggregate information that better equips faculty to deal with academically at risk students. And then lastly I would say that the trend for increasing faculty retirements, particularly at the administrative levels. In other words, we've got obviously many, many baby boomer era deans, um, associate deans, those that in the past have been charged primarily with curriculum review, construction, um, you know, revision, et cetera. They're now retiring out in large numbers and it, in nursing this has created a, a crisis that's looming once again in terms of not only nursing shortage as the pipeline of nurses is um, potentially inhibited by the lack of qualified faculty to educate them, but also the fact that inexperienced faculty do not have those curriculum writing and revision skills and many times they even lack basic skills in test item writing and exam analysis. So I think it's wonderful that ExamSoft is sponsoring a, another webinar that particularly addresses the importance of item writing and analysis in preparing very, very good, solid, reliable, and valid assessments. So the administration's response to this is 
a lot of care around the risk management side. Testing policies that lack consistencies pose problems for administrators trying to look for consistency across their program. They are really concerned that there may not be trust of the actual assessment tools, obviously, and then of course there's consequences that play out when the student's poor performance on these lead to difficulties with them um, tracking correctly and, and uh, uh, making it all the way through the program. So policy making has in the past, I would say, been guided primarily by faculty expertise, which is an important aspect and, and not something to veer completely away from, but it now must be equally supported by tangible evidence that the policy is, is well-footed. So when we talk about testing policies and procedures and the need for that consistency and that evidence base, this is really important, obviously, for defensibility of any of the assessments that are used in the course uh, throughout the curriculum. This is going to come up again and again as part of um, the program self-studies for both voluntary accreditation, but uh, obviously even regulatory, because in many cases, as in healthcare disciplines, there's a regulatory aspect where the um, Board of Nursing or other representatives in the state that have similar power must approve a nursing course uh, curriculum and a program for graduates to be eligible to enter the profession and sit for the related licensure and certification exam, as well as the requirements across voluntary accreditation uh, for the program itself and the university as a whole. So that whole process sits within the evidence. How defensible are your tests? That should be a question that your testing committee is constantly asking. Do test blueprints, in other words, the plan for the test, does it align with course objectives? And of course, do those course objectives then align with the overall objectives for the program and the mission and vision of the university? Standard scoring procedures, are these used for each test? One of the difficulties that occurs when the scoring procedures are very different from course to course is that it becomes apparent right away that in many cases students may be getting double messages about what is considered an acceptable performance in one course versus the other. That will indeed impact the defensibility of your assessments when that kind of, of confusion may be arising. So the, the structure of policies has obviously become more complex. They should be constructed using the American Psychological Association's code, and I've included a link here um, just to remind everyone that the Code of Fair Testing Practices in Education by the American Psychological Association should indeed be a framework across every type of education program. In nursing, some of the nursing education organizations have taken the next step and actually applied specific uh, code relative to nursing programs along the same lines. But the bottom line is if your tests are being routinely analyzed and they're, you're using a statistical item analysis methodology across all courses and all tests and you have very clear procedures that faculty will follow for either rescoring or review processes, you're eliminating the ambiguity when it comes to these all important decisions about student progression and their ability to master the objectives. So it's important for test outcomes and the analysis process to all be analyzed and documented and that effort is the one that's really driving the need for testing committees at this point in time. You know, in the day when the faculty could meet together and there was not a, a huge push for so much statistical item analysis um, and documentation of outcomes, but it was more process oriented, there really wasn't necessarily that much of a drive or, or a need for a testing committee. But now that these um, complicated factors are arising, this is not one of those things that you can put off until maybe a year before your reaffirmation of reaccreditation and suddenly everyone is scrambling looking for multiple years worth of documentation that may not even exist about the process of handling the curriculum review and how the testing program was actually um, analyzed throughout those years of, of uh, administration of the program. 
So uh, where do testing policy uh, and governance actually sit? Well, I do want to make a very clear um, caveat here about the role of the testing committee. In most of the, the programs where I uh, do consulting work now and faculty and deans that I've talked to over the years, it's very clear that there's typically a student affairs type committee or some type of student affairs body that governs grading policies, handles grievance issues, reviews, uh, admission, progression, graduation requirements as I've listed here. But the important thing that happens is that the testing committee has to remain in sync with that student affairs committee. So while the student affairs committee may actually be handling individual candidate concerns or making be the official policy making arm for things like readmission policies to the program after the student has failed a course or has withdrawn uh, either voluntarily or involuntarily from a course. The bottom line is the testing committee is there in the background charged with identifying evidence of the, of the health overall of the assessment program and feeding that evidence into the process that the, the whole faculty take on in reviewing the curriculum for soundness and achievement of the, the stated outcomes. So synergy is very helpful. And one of the things the testing committee can do is they can actually review aggregate student data. So student response data from your assessments is extremely valuable in helping you identify and establish by policy the types of scoring benchmarks that you find acceptable in meeting your objectives and your outcomes for your program. So again, if you have multiple semesters worth of test data from one particular cohort, that's extremely valuable information to coalesce. If you add that to the data gathered longitudinally from other cohorts, you get an even bigger, broader picture. And the good thing about that is that you're making real evaluation of causes of program weakness or some of those gaps that I mentioned earlier that you see on evidence. And you're not necessarily doing what I would call a more knee-jerk reaction that sometimes happens in nursing programs in particular when faculty have a cohort that has a particularly poor outcome. Maybe there's a very high attrition rate because a lot of academic failures are happening in a particular course. Or there's problems occurring at the end of the program when graduates are sitting for the uh, nursing licensure exam and there's a very poor pass rate that results. Typically the response is, oh well we've immediately just got to go fix, quote unquote, the curriculum. And if you uh, take that approach, without a really good broad view of the evidence, you may be doing our classic thing since I'm from Texas uh, and fixing something that's not broken. So if it's not broken, don't fix it. And in this case, if you have aggregate data that you can refer to and that your testing committee has been tracking all along, you may even be able to proactively address difficulties that a cohort might have before they even arrive at that point because you can see difficulties that have arisen on testing instruments that have picked up weaknesses throughout the student body. The other thing that happens is when you combine that review of your aggregated student test results with your faculty expert opinion, you get a much stronger case for doing a, a necessary curriculum revision. And it's very important to point out that you can't just collect the data. And I think that's why the testing committees have come to the forefront now as being so useful. A lot of times the nursing programs, faculty were very good at collecting data, but it literally would sit on the shelf in, in uh, you know, a bunch of notebooks and get dusty. Or now with a lot of our computerized records, there's a huge amount of data accumulated, but the process stops there. And what really needs to happen is the analysis continues and you close that evaluation loop where you identify what the problems are from a review of the, the uh, student data coming out of multiple types of um, assessments and evaluation uh, tools that you've got embedded in the program. You complete your evaluation and then enact change within the curriculum in a very, very uh, systematic manner. And that's what actually really adheres a program to 
a plan to meet stated national standards and makes them very highly successful when they are facing a reaffirmation of accreditation type of, of uh, period. The other thing I would mention, and this is kind of back to the individual student, so we'll take a view backwards, not from the total aggregate or even longitudinally of an entire class as they move through the program, but back to that at-risk student in particular, one of the things the testing committee can do is provide evidence to student affairs so that when the individual student's case may arise, if there's some type of grievance or there's some type of crossroads that must occur in the decisions about admission progression and graduation, the testing committee's work will provide evidence of where scoring benchmarks have been set and in some cases that's very beneficial to student affairs. It allows for a much more objective view of where the student stands. Did they you know, meet the benchmark or not? And then there's guidance because of well-built policy on, this, on the student affairs side as to how to deal with consequences of what the performance actually is. So one of the ways to build this type of data set is to adopt some type of longitudinal student data collection tool. And course coordinators should submit the data sets each semester uh, for the assessments they've given in their course to the testing committee. In that way, the testing committee can really get that broad view across all the courses. And if there's a course that doesn't have sufficient data, that can be brought to the attention of the administration sooner and not later, where semester after semester, that particular course really runs without sufficient evaluation um, data supporting it. The other thing that can be helpful from this process is that remediation plans, and I really encourage faculty to create these in the form of a student learning contract that is also part of student affairs committee consequence type of, of actions, but is clearly stated that the learning contract is the, the key for the student to be able to progress to the next level or whatever the, the uh, desired outcome would be. If remediation plans reference some of these standard benchmarks and standard requirements, then there's not a lot of controversy about, oh, well, the students being, uh, you know, instructed to do so much more work than another student or anything along that line. Then you can formulate tools that will summarize this stuff. The good news about computerized testing programs, the kinds of things that um, ExamSoft has in their applications literally make the, the workload so much less for faculty. They can push a button, they can get a report that summarizes the entire testing instrument, handles all of the calculations, you know, by the computer doing them for the item analysis information. So at that point, the faculty literally can work from the report and conduct their analysis with much of that information already, you know, summarized and crunched out uh, with the uh, appropriate item analysis statistics for them to reference. So really what should happen in this kind of regard is the at-risk student does receive a fair, um, reliable, valid test and also is a beneficiary of a impartial student affairs committee applying consequences that are based on very clear evidence of what leads to success in this particular nursing program and how does that student um, need to work to get there. So I want to turn to the best practices in testing and this is just a term uh, coined to really take what most nursing faculty are comfortable with out of clinical best practice but apply it to nursing education and their, their actual testing procedures. So it, for best practices in testing, that testing committee certainly needs a proper representation and authority to conduct their business. And I think this is one area where we've got to be careful because the testing committee is not going to become the test police, so to speak. In other words, this is not the test police coming around to beat up on all the course coordinators who failed to submit their aggregate data uh, or, you know, rat out somebody who's clearly avoiding following, you know, said policy and coursework. I mean, there's, there's lots of other administrative avenues for that, and that's not what the role of the testing committee really is. The idea here is that the testing committee 
does have representation across all levels of the program so that faculty are assured, for instance, if they teach at the upper level of the major, that there's representation from that level as well as from the lower levels. And the lower level faculty who have the students just entering the program that clearly don't have the same knowledge and skills as those at the point of exit don't feel burdened by the fact that only the faculty who have the most proficient students that in the program are leveling policy that makes their life miserable particularly. There's really got also to be it's a very uh, intentional plan by the administration to supply sufficient resources to the testing committee. With the changes in technology and the uh, real uh, dynamics of the uh, psychometrics, the science behind assessment happening, faculty need to hone their skills, they need to stay abreast of new types of technologies that have been released and they can do that through attending continuing education type things. They can also work specifically with a company like ExamSoft with their expertise that can be um, you know, shared. So this, the resources have to be there. They have to have a computerized testing um, application of some type. The item bank is critically important as you know. The exam bank has to stay up to date and it's just a massive amount of work uh, to try to do all of that manually and really doesn't make sense anymore. So the testing committee needs the proper resource to make all this happen. There also needs to be very clear delineation in the program hierarchy about where the testing committee sits in relation to all other committees. And I've already talked about the synergy that needs to happen with the Student Affairs Committee, but most often I recommend to faculties that they make the testing committee a subset, so to speak, of the curriculum committee. And so policy and procedures can be recommended by the testing committee, but these are only approved when the entire faculty or the, the oversight typically of the curriculum that's charged to the um, specific faculty and administrators that uh, must have that oversight will approve of those testing committee recommended policies. And there is some degree of enforcement. So as I said above, yes, this shouldn't be the testing police, but certainly there should be an avenue through the administration if there are gaps that are uh, you know, obviously happening. You've got item writing style guides that we're going to talk about in a minute, for example, is the best practice. And if those are not being adhered to, they bring the whole level of the item bank down a notch. And somebody's got to have the ability then to step in there and say, no, we can't pose that kind of risk to the entire program simply because we have one or two outlying courses where the items don't meet our requirements. So it is important to have an avenue for ensuring that all of these kinds of things that are adopted as best practices are carried out. So here's a, a kind of a quick way to summarize each of the best practices. Um, this list is by no means inclusive, but I think it will give you a good head start in thinking about ways that you could establish a testing committee within your program and the kinds of things that you want this particular committee to be charged with doing. So one of the most important aspects in terms of best practices is actually designing, revising, keeping up to date the program's testing policies. A guideline for exam development is so important and as a new faculty member on several occasions that had none of that to work from, I can promise you for your novice faculty that you're trying to develop and grow in your program for future leadership, uh, you've got to give them some kind of a tool and place to start. A lot of this information will be very concrete. It will be your writing style protocol. Now, why is it important to even have one of those? Well, I, I would put yourself in your student's shoes. This really isn't an issue about you know, academic freedom, et cetera. I mean, obviously, the faculty are charged with making sure that the test items reflect what's you know, going to be taught in the course and what the course objectives delineate. But when the writing style is so distracting to the student, so in nursing, a typical fault along this line would be that one stem of a question will begin with the term the patient, you know, something happens to the patient. The next question might begin with a, a, a patient's name, a made-up name. Then the next question might begin with 
the client because some, the nursing licensure exam adopted the term client a long time ago. Well, for a student who may be looking at a test that has those three questions, one after the other, it's very much of a distraction to have so much variation in the way the, the person who's receiving nursing care is being addressed. It looks minor, but if you sit there and take a test that's going to contain over 100 questions, perhaps, it can really be, it can really drag the student down. So a lot of the writing style protocol simply gives faculty guidelines for consistency in the types of um, subjects and phrasing that they use in their questions so that the item bank, instead of looking like a mishmash brought in from a whole bunch of non-related sources, begins to look much more like a homogeneous test bank, similar to what a standardized testing company or the nursing licensure um, author would have at, at their disposal to use. You also want to increase the cognitive taxonomy leveling of all of your questions. And in most disciplines now, simply supplying a boatload of knowledge base, you know, recall type memorization uh, questions is not acceptable. The student actually has to use several pieces of information supplied in the STEM as well as their own knowledge of the content to then make some kind of application of that knowledge to the situation identified in the, in the STEM of the question. So these guidelines should be established by the testing committee and used throughout all of the courses so that, that the tests have some consistency to them. Other types of consistency issues. How long should exams be? What is the number of items that should be on the typical exam? Some of this is indeed constrained literally by the way the university has applied their semester hour calculation, uh, their class time, but there should be some consistency to it. Also, proctoring guidelines should be very clear and very much the same in any engagement that you have with students who are taking a proctored test. Dissemination of grades. How is that going to happen? Does the university now have um, a prohibition against the, the posting of grades because of violation of, of FERPA, other types of student confidentiality issues? So how are grades going to be disseminated? One of the controversies that I've seen happen over and over again in nursing programs is that one faculty member may be willing to provide the student with immediate feedback about the grade and that will be the final grade. Whereas another faculty wants to have the opportunity to review the questions, review the entire test, look at the item analysis statistics. So their determination is that the student will receive their grade no later than three business days following the administration of the exam. There needs to be some consistency there. And there certainly needs to be uh, a resolution to the situation where, where the group of students will point at one professor, oh, well, this is the person who's, you know, doing what, what we anticipate that we need, and this professor is not, when in reality there may be a, a true basis here that the testing committee needs to look at as to what is the best type of policy surrounding dissemination of grades so that it's done fairly across all the courses. And then lastly, the ever controversial test review. Uh, faculties need to grapple with the issue. Do they let students actually see the real test content that they took in a proctored exam in particular after the fact, or do they simply allow them to see some of the um, teacher prepared uh, rationales or explanations of correct and incorrect answers? These kinds of questions should be addressed by the testing committee. The testing committee should also use a systematic item analysis that has psychometric underpinning to it for their review process that happens across all tests. So the course coordinators and the faculty assigned to teach the course need to carry out these activities and they'll provide a summary back to the testing committee at the end of the semester. But the type of analysis that's done should be based on recommendations that the testing committee makes. And finally, as I've mentioned before, the testing committee should look at those big aggregate findings so that results from assessments can be made back to the curriculum kit committee um, in the form of evidence in case there are indeed curricular changes um, that, that should be made that are evident from the student performance that's viewed across all of these different assessment tools. Another best practice 
is that writing style protocol. So I'll take it even further than just the example I gave about the patient, the client, and um, actual made-up names being used. Uh, little things like how do we begin and end the stem? What kind of tense do we use with verbs? If you, again, put yourself in the shoes of the student and you try to look through a test that has a mishmash of all of this stuff with no consistency, I think you'll find yourself how totally distracting it is for the student to actually try to get at the heart of what you really want them to do, which is to apply their knowledge and skills in answering the question, and they're still trying to comb through a lot of the awkward um, sentence structure and, and such that you may be able to avoid by simply providing guidelines that all the faculty agree on um, for the pre preparation of the exams. What about those application and above items? So thinking back to the cognitive taxonomy, really when your testing committee is reviewing individual exams, one of the things that's very important is that they have a good understanding of the way an application or analysis um, evaluation type item, the higher level items on the, on the taxonomy, how those actually look in comparison to knowledge, memorization, basic comprehension style questions. And a quick rule of thumb that I work with faculties um, all the time on when I'm teaching effective item writing is to look at your answer to your question. If a student could look up that exact selected option from that question and find the answer on a single page in a single paragraph uh, from one of their textbooks, then you simply ask them to recall knowledge that's at the factual level from the book. That's not going to constitute an application or above type of item. So you've got to look for how is that information to be used. And the, and the way that you can do this through, again, good item writing is to have the student pull together two or three important facts, uh, perhaps, and knowledge of what the standard of care is, and then select an action um, that should be done in some type of priority. That's a very, very classic way to construct these questions. When you use statistical parameters for item analysis, um, the testing committee again can weigh in on these kinds of issues. What is the minimally acceptable difficulty level uh, that a test item can have on a test in your department? Uh, think about that. Maybe there's not any stipulation right now and it's, you know, some faculty will defend their right to keep an item on a test that only one out of 30, 40, 50 students uh, will answer correctly. Well, is that acceptable? Is the item really uh, critical? Is it a piece of material that the student absolutely must possess? And then the question needs to be asked, well, if so few students can answer that question correctly, is it a problem with the way the question is actually worded? Or is there a critical piece of information or a critical skill or an action that the student should be able to um, reply on um, categorically without any problem and they're not getting that information in the course. What kind of discrimination level are you trying to achieve? In other words, with any discrimination level, in my case I've indicated a point by serial correlation coefficient, but you may be more commonly using uh, some type of, of, of index. It, whatever statistic you use, the bottom line is you need to have an established level of where you want to see the tests uh, actually perform for you. Are you getting discrimination levels that are, are meeting national standards of acceptability and your test therefore um, is really not just producing arbitrary information for you but students who are performing well on all of the questions consistently perform well throughout the test and score highly while students who don't know the material or not answering the questions correctly consistently also perform in that unacceptable pattern. That's what your discrimination index can can help you with. How many mastery items should be included? And this is a, a concept again of content that is um, absolutely essential that the student must master in order to pass this course or to move to the next level of the curriculum. In many cases, there'll be mastery items embedded across all of the tests in the curriculum that deal with, um, you know, non-negotiable subject matter the students must know. A classic 
uh, example of that in nursing would be um, dosage calculation for uh, accurate administration of medications. There's a certain number of test items that the student must 100% answer correctly, for instance. Those need to be excluded from the overall item analysis because you expect that 100% of the students will answer those questions correctly. Um, otherwise, that will skew the rest of your analysis of the rest of the test. But sometimes that's important because that consistency will ensure that certain curricular threads that are absolute musts will always appear in each, in each course. And at the time that you're preparing, for instance, your self-study for reaffirmation of accreditation, it will become very evident by literally a, a touch of a button in the um, exam soft application, for instance, you'd be able to instantly say, oh, here's where these mastery items sit in our test blueprint. You can see across all of our test blueprints that we always include, what, 5% or maybe no more than 10% of those type of dosage calculation items, and I can show you that throughout every test that we give in the program. That's an amazing story to tell. It's very credible evidence. It's right there, um, very objective, and it, it certainly wraps back into what we talked about before, the good old evaluation loop that shows that indeed what you set out as course objectives and, and program outcomes are addressed throughout the entire curriculum, and the evaluation information is there to make sure that that happens at an acceptable level. And then lastly, what is your reliability coefficient? that you find to be acceptable for an exam. This should be consistent across the program. I'm going to supply you with my uh, take on a three-step item analysis method and what the standard should be. Um, you may hear variations on this depending on the type of discipline, the psychometrics uh, behind assessment, but I, I think it's, it's at least it will give you something to consider regardless of the benchmarks that you choose for your program particularly. But every instructor has got to review their overall difficulty level for the exam as part of their exam review. And I very much believe that these item analysis steps need to be taken after the exam has been administered and before the final grades are disseminated to the students. Because if there is some decision about altering the actual um, scoring procedures, either because there's been a frank error that needs to be resolved or because some of these questions did not perform from an item analysis perspective at the level that the faculty had anticipated and they need to be withdrawn from decisions about the student performance. That needs to happen without students staring at you in your face giving pressure to the faculty to get that information around. So the testing committee can recommend, as I mentioned, maybe there's a 72-hour or a three-business-day period where students know up front. They're not going to hear anything from faculty about their final grade determination on their exam because that's the period when the faculty are conducting their systematic analysis of the class's performance in the overall test itself. Um, besides reviewing difficulty level, of course, discrimination data in any type, and then the effectiveness of alternatives can be extremely helpful because if you've got some questions that frankly have distractors or answer options that are not plausible, and even the worst student in the class um, can figure out that that's not a correct answer, you've eliminated the opportunity for a really good distractor to be in there. And that particular portion of the question needs to be rewritten before the question is used again. These are the standards for um, acceptance. Um, I've written about these and I, and I talk about these with faculty all the time. I think they're, they're very good standards and they give a testing committee, again, some consistent information that's very objective that they can put out there for all of the faculty to follow. In nursing, there's a little bit of leeway allowed simply because the students, by the point that they're uh, particularly getting in the um, final uh, upper level of the program preparing for graduation, they're a very homogeneous group. They have very similar clinical experiences at that point, and so there's not necessarily going to be the same amount of variance in the scores that drives these statistics in particular when the test analysis is being done. So 
with not as much variance, we've got to give a little bit more leeway in terms of discrimination and reliability. But I think, again, there's strength in these. The standards for acceptance are, are well publicized now and well known. And the testing committee can certainly weigh in on adopting these and making that recommendation to the full curriculum or faculty committee. Those response frequencies uh, that I mentioned before, you've got a non-performing distractor. You need to get rid of it. It's, it's really dragging your test down. If, if an option is chosen by fewer than 30 test takers out of a, a, you know, a group of 100, for example, this means that you've got a really uh, poor item discrimination. You've got a poor difficulty level. Uh, you need to get that question rewritten before anybody else takes that test. The good news about that is you've got something very um, doable in terms of, you, you know, you're not forcing the issue of, well, we've got to rewrite the entire set of items before we give the test again. No, not necessarily. You're using your systematic item analysis methodology to pinpoint the questions that are problematic and then even do kind of surgical editing, if you will, of just the areas that need to be revised. Maybe it's a single distractor and it's actually a very good question. Once you re-enter that question onto the exam, collect item analysis data from subsequent classes, you really may have saved yourself a lot of work in the long run because you've got a good question there that's been um, appropriately salvaged. This is a very simplistic view of a master test blueprint. As I said, the computerized item banking and exam administration software is really superior because it gives you a test blueprint immediately across all of your scoring categorizations of interest. And you can attach those directly to your course objectives in the item bank and produce a document that's much more sophisticated than this, but frankly also one that does not require the faculty to invest time with that once the item is originally tagged with the appropriate objective, identified at the appropriate cognitive level, um, cognitive taxonomy level, and placed in the item bank and starts accruing item analysis statistics. You do need to generate those electronic blueprints. As I said, these can be extremely helpful at the point that you're collecting your evidence during maybe a reaffirmation of um, accreditation, a self-study preparation. This one, of course, is nursing. I apologize for the small print, but um, nursing process and nursing client needs from the licensure exam are always very, very important to most faculties as um, part of their uh, indicators. They want to track student performance across these two major areas in every course. So you can set a percentage of the exam for instance, in the case of you may have indicated at about the fourth line there that you want to have always at least 9 or 10 percent of every test reflecting the student's ability to answer questions about how to perform the assessment. In this case, this exam blueprint contains 9.09 percent assessment items. So the faculty member can immediately look at that proportion, compare it to what the testing committee has recommended to be the standard, add another test item from assessment to the exam to raise it up to 10 percent. You see how this process goes. It gives the faculty some real guidance when they can look at the exam blueprint. And it, it takes us out of the more informal exam blueprint, which is the type faculty churn in their heads all the time. You know, which topic did I cover? and how much lecture time that I spend on that topic, which is important in driving the construction of the test, but you've got to look at these other aspects um, at the same time. And I find that the computer does that a whole lot better than myself alone trying to carry those threads all the way through my brain while I'm putting an exam together. And then lastly, I would say there's some type of summary of test review document that you really want to provide to faculty. This would be the classic document that's completed at the end of each test and then are summarized at the end of the course and handed over to the testing committee for aggregate analysis. If there are particular items that you as a faculty course coordinator have already recognized need to be improved, they can be documented on some type of form like this 
the date that they were rewritten or the date that they were edited can be shown. And that again is very, very important documentation when it comes around to self-study and accreditation time to show that you not only identified that you had a uh, test item that needed to be addressed because there were flaws in it, but then you took the action and you did something about it. So for best practices, uh, generally speaking, improve your blueprints, adopt some guidelines, increase your proportion of application and above items on the cognitive taxonomy across your item bank, use a systematic item analysis approach. In the case of nursing, I would include this other caveat to be sure that alternative item formats, those are item formats beyond just the multiple choice single answer type, that include things like the fill in the blank items, the select all that apply, or multiple select items. These kinds of items will appear on the student's licensure exam, and they need to consistently be part of the teacher made tests that the students receive throughout the program so that they build skills with taking those items just as effectively as a, as a multiple choice single, single answer item. Take out items that no longer align with standards, remove obsolete phrases, eliminate, in the case of nursing, trade names for most medications. Now, people look at that in horror and say, oh my gosh, when did that happen? Well, the licensure exam authoring um, changed all that back in summer of last year, so you can't necessarily solve this across your entire item bank in a single semester, but you need a plan for how you're going to systematically eliminate all of those pharmaceutical trade names and use generic names unless it you know makes sense to have a trade name and you can refer to the National Council uh, for State Boards of Nursing guidance on, on how they handle that issue. For, for competencies that you've got to test in each and every course, as I mentioned the dosage calculation for medications, you need to set a a guideline for the faculty so that you get, in this case, I'd recommend 10% of items on every exam would be reflective of that content. You need to be consistent about the length of exams, um, what the time allotment is going to be for proctored exams. Establishing scoring benchmarks will be extremely important when it comes to the Student Affairs Committee setting up consequences for benchmarks not being achieved by individual students, for instance. And you do need to have consistent weighting, whether it be standardized exams, teacher-made tests, always consult any guidelines that are coming from your regulatory body, in the case of nursing, like the, the Board of Nursing, about how some of that weighting should occur. But again, whether you're testing committee, you've got someone there with oversight, you've got a group that will make sure that that happens. Identify consequences for failure. That's role for your student affairs committee to really um, uh, weigh in on. And when those remediation activities are established, there really needs to be some consistency in those learning contracts. And finally, I would say um, test security measures should be a topic that your testing committee um, increasingly spends time with. There's a lot of information in the education literature now about test security. One of the benefits I've mentioned, obviously, of technology is the ability to get some of those item analysis calculations performed very quickly and letting the computer do the work. One of the downsides of technology is the increase in um, ways that, that students can illicitly access test content, perhaps, uh, through you know, all concerns about um, internet hacking, illicit copies of, of exams online, and even security uh, breaches that occur during an actual test administration with students uh, sneaking in covert cameras and this kind of thing. So because we're in a high-tech world, your testing committee needs to be well aware of test security measures. So I have included a few words of wisdom here I think about vigilance with test security and things derived from literature um, and I really certainly encourage you to review um, the education literature for best practices across effective proctoring and methods for discouraging cheating. 
Um, finally, the, the data forensics that you can um, obtain from the breakdown of response patterns in your exams through your testing application can actually be part of your best um, defense on this, on this kind of issue. There's lots of references out there. I, I would say just in conclusion, it's important for your testing committee to have those resources and access to standard practice and guidelines and to work in concert with both the Student Affairs Committee and to the larger uh, curriculum committee to, uh, with whom they serve. So I, I would just say in the, in the closing few minutes here, we may have a, a couple of minutes to entertain some um, questions from the group, but um, certainly the time is now. You really need to start thinking about establishing your testing committee in advance of your reaffirmation of accreditation visit, for instance. That might be two or three years down the road. So think about forming your testing committee now as a way of helping get ready for that visit and establishing some policies and procedures that will give you the good consistent practices throughout your program. Jason, I think I'll turn this back to you for um, moderation of any, any questions that have come in from the group. If there are no questions, then I'll simply provide you with this resource. Oh, yeah, thank you, yeah, thank you, Dr. Nybert, for that incredibly insightful presentation today. Um, I, I appreciate, and, uh, and uh, on behalf of the, the all of the attendees today, thank you so much for your time. Unfortunately, we won't have time for questions as we just have a couple of minutes remaining. Um, I would, however, like to remind all of the attendees to please. Um, consider attending tomorrow's presentation entitled Applying the Peer Review Process to the Development of Learning Assessments. This session does focus on the creation and peer review process of test items used for the assessment of student learning. And as, as noted, this is scheduled for tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, if you'll go to the next slide. Uh, as we do not have time for questions, I do encourage you all to submit your questions by, via email. Uh, we will follow up with you directly after uh, the conclusion of today's presentation. Uh, please email info at examsoft.com and we will follow up with answers to any of your questions. Additionally, uh, as a reminder, uh, in two to three days you will receive a link to the webinar uh, with uh, a video recording as well as the presentation deck. Uh, you are welcome to share this material with your colleagues uh, if you do see fit. Uh, and uh, to share this resource with, with everyone. Um, we do apologize for any login issues today. We will further investigate this to ensure that the process is smoother for any future webinars. Um, thank you again so much, Dr. Nybert, for your time this morning and sharing your expertise.